speculation because the TV show doesn't even exist, but if it's presented as science fiction, then people are going to enjoy that for it being science fiction. And then it's based on a true story. They can go and they can look at the information. So it's not that you're releasing a, a movie saying this is all 100 million percent true. Although that is what you say about your testimony, you know, but you're going into the entertainment industry with it. Right. So there's that level of people are going to watch it because it's enjoyable. It's entertaining. You have to make it entertaining and enjoyable for it to be successful. And, uh, you know, Cosmic Disclosure has been very successful, and it was just two guys sitting with a fake brick wall behind them, talking in like a sort of like a briefing. Mm-hmm. Very simple, you know. But uh, it's it's entertaining. I know uh, it, there are a good number of people that watch the show that don't believe a word of it, but the information's getting into their subconscious. Uh, I've had people come up to me at conferences and say, "I don't believe a word you're saying." But it is the most interesting stuff I've ever seen, or, or you know, or whatever. And that doesn't hurt my feelings. Uh, it's just like you know, there's people been out there that have you know poo pooed me or got on the poo poo quarry train <laughs> that uh, have said some things, and I don't have any animosity. I'll work with those people tomorrow. It's, it, it hasn't uh, affected me, you know. But uh, you know, I it, these deep attacks that are rooted that all go back really to to Bill Ryan and Avalon. Um, you know, though though that's an annoyance that I would like to see go away. But from what I hear, uh, he'll, he he's going to be cursing me in his dying breath. You know, he, he I'm told that he blames me f- also for uh, his marriage ending. You know. Which uh, is, is very unfortunate. I, it was during the time uh, that all of the unpleasantness was happening um, when I first came out. Um, he was, uh, Christine was telling me, uh, he's trying to trigger you, he's trying to trigger you, he's manipulating you, he's trying to make you blow up and look bad in public. Uh, he's obsessed with you, you know. And then it was weeks later, you know, she uh, contacts me and she's, you know, freaking out that she said, she had to vacate the house because, uh, you know, he, he threatened to kill her because he was so triggered over all of this. So, and she wasn't really, I don't know what was going on, but she was trying to ground him and say, you know, Corey's not that bad or something like that. And that's when, you know, tripped out, you know, flipped out on her. And apparently it scared her so badly that the next time he went into town, she packed up and I guess took half the gold out of the uh, safe, according to... Uh, uh, Bill and uh, left because I mean, she was scared. So you know there was a uh, and you know for for some reason you know I guess he was triggered because of me when that happened. That that's just what I've been told by some people from Avalon that have contacted me quietly is that you know he has a lot of animosity towards me about that as well. Well, it sounds like in the last couple of years there have been a lot of things that have happened. Um, around you and to you and involving you that have been some good, some bad. And I'm hoping that this interview now can be some energetic closure for you for some of the things that have happened in the past, Mm -hmm. helping give new energy and light into the projects that you're actively working on now so that we can get some space in between and get some positive uh, Mm -hmm. creation out there uh, and get some of those new energies flowing. Yeah. Yeah. All of this is, you know, uh, it's affected things. A lot of people, like I said, had a knee jerk reaction to that Satanism uh, baloney that they put out um, and withdrew, uh, including some team members. Uh, Some of them withdrew just because of all the negativity around. So, and us dealing with the negativity, it's knocked off about a month of our creativity and productivity. You know, we're, we're really behind on a lot of things. So, this is going to be my last word on it. And then we're just moving on and we're ignoring that small, uh, noisy minority that are bringing up all of these lies. I think people are going to see them for what they are. Anyone that spent time with us at these conferences or retreats, they know that it is absolutely wrong. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. Let's get through this. So. Now we're going to talk about how you got into this and how you are supported. So the allegations are you are a pathological liar, you're a government plant, and you built your testimony off of other people's stories. So, uh, let's see. May 29th interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan. A minute and 29 
Uh, Bill Ryan says that you're a pathological liar. There are others who claim to have gone to high school with you that say you're a pathological liar in high school. And I wanted to give you an opportunity yes. to respond to this claim. That's the same, this same person that claims to have gone to high school with me that uh, Bill keeps bringing up um, did not go to my high school. They first approached me saying, I went to high school with you. And they had the wrong state or the wrong city, the wrong state, the wrong school. Nothing was right. And I've challenged that person, show me a yearbook with your photo in it and your name in it and my face being in the same yearbook and we'll talk. And they digress every time. None of their information matches. And um, yeah, they're spreading around that uh, I was a bully and all this, but I was a head shorter than everyone. I, would, I got... Uh, I was kicked out of junior highs and high schools, and it was for fighting. Um, and my nickname was Kickin' Ass Corey because I was this little scrawny guy about a head shorter than everyone else. And the bullies would come and try to mess with me. And I grew up in such, obviously, a crazy environment and, and had training that uh, I wouldn't do the back and forth bully stuff. And so if I saw I was about to get my butt kicked by a bully, I would strike first and you know, was usually justified. Um, but this person, uh, this lady, I think it's Nikki, I can't remember, uh, that's claiming that they went to high school with me. It's, it's a total fabrication. Um, it's uh, something that uh, this person said that they've been in contact with a dark journalist and told them everything. And I was like, okay, you went to the person telling lies about me and gave them more lies. You know, so what? Okay. Stupid. Okay, let's see. Uh... Uh, well, this... <laughs> This person uh, also seems to pop up. There's this another lady that contacts me all the time saying that I'm her real son that was uh, kidnapped from her uh, when, uh, when uh, I was an infant. And she's convinced of it. And she has her family convinced of it. And I've received emails from them. So there's a whole lot of weird stuff like that that happens. Oh, okay. So... I wouldn't doubt if they contact uh, Dark Journalist next and he'll be... Corey's real mom goes on the record. <laughs> Whistleblower of truth. Yeah. Corey's real mom. <clears throat> truth in 2017. Is that what? Oh, I don't know. Uh, That's funny. Okay. Go for truth. Uh, <laughs> Bill Ryan in an interview on May 7th with Dark Journalist says that one of the Project Avalon IT administrators, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correct, if it's even a real name, Illy Pandia, after having firsthand experience of your claimed IT experience, said something does not add up. He is not an IT expert. Can you tell us why he might have said that, what he was referring to, and can you tell us about your interaction with him? I know you've already provided documentation yeah. online yeah. that has proved your certifications, but I'm more so interested in understanding about I've, the interaction. With I've, this never, I've never known what exchange they're talking about. Oh, okay. It was just something... Um, I guess in general conversations I had uh, with people, I don't even remember this, so I'm trying to speculate. Oh, okay. uh, general conversations I had with somebody, people in the IT industry are real catty. Uh, people that do, um, you know, uh, that are all into. Um, it must be the only industry where they're catty. It must be. <laughs> uh, people that are like Unix administrators. Oh, Unix is the best. Everyone that does Microsoft, they're it's just stupid. They're you know it's you know you know Microsoft people are uh, you, you know it's it's that way. And uh, someone that's really versed in Unix would talk to a person that's really versed in uh, you know the Microsoft platform, and you know. They're going to be like, well, this is my way is so much more efficient. And, other, and they, that's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been for 20 years that I've been in. So that might have something to contribute to it. The person may have just had a beef with me. I don't know where that came from. But for Bill Ryan to assert Corey uh, faked his IT career, it's not real, based on hearsay from someone in his forum. And then going out to the public and spitting it out as though it is a fact that he's verified and researched is irresponsible. It's, it's disinformation, pure and simple. Okay. So we'll move on from that. Um, borrowed testimony. So can you speak a little bit about that? Um, Bill Ryan's claim that you borrowed testimony from particularly Michael Relf in the year 2000. There was a yeah. book called... Or an account called the Mars Records? Right. Um, when I first started, and this is very interesting because I think I have this documented as well, 
uh, conversations I had with uh, Bill Ryan, uh, and I first started sharing my testimony with him, it was like just before I started doing cosmic disclosure and all that. Um, he said, have you read this book? And I said, no. So he sent me a PDF of it. And I started looking through it, and it was all of these uh, Scientology sessions and stuff. I, I would like, read through it, and there would be like some little bits of, like, uh, I was on Mars or something. I, I, it was not coherent for me. I, I looked through it, and I, was, I just tossed it aside. So, no, I did not data mine that document for, for my information. It was after uh, I had given Bill Ryan my, my information that he shared that with me. And, of course, I could see his affinity for it since he is majorly into Scientology. And that testimony was gleaned from, um, I can't remember the type of what they call the sessions, uh, the Scientology sessions, uh, uh, where they use all these different instruments and techniques to have, help you recall memories and stuff. Okay, so let's see. Criticism, the next section is criticism about conduct. So the first uh, one is, why don't you take a test to prove you're telling the truth? We'll break these down in a second. Your family threatened Bill Ryan, leave the more fantastical claims out of your testimony and your testimony has no journalistic value. So the first one, why don't you take a test to prove you're telling the truth, whether it be a polygraph or do a hypnotic regression? Um, well, as far as the hypnotic regression, um, the regressive work uh, could bring about a lot, bring out a lot of the information that uh, the Maya suppressed. Because um, when uh, um, I had a, a, a detached retina, and it took them three surgeries to get it back on. When I went in, uh, the uh, surgeon looked at my eye and he said. This is, he said, your uh, retina is like a canned tomato. He said, we, can, we can't hardly get it back together. He says, it's, and other aspects of it, it looks like astronaut's eye. So, you know, uh, we, you know, they had to do three surgeries to get it attached again. And uh, the trauma of having needles stuck in my eye and all the things, it, it brought all of my memories from all three 20 and backs and different things I was forced to take part in I brought all those memories back and there were a lot of extremely dark memories and I was literally suicidal. It was really bad. And the Mayans came and they suppressed those memories and I, they need to be kept suppressed. Now as far as a, a lie detector test, when we, uh, we've talked about doing it for the show and a couple things. That's something that we're kicking around. Um, you know, at someone like myself that has been put through so many different testing uh, I can't even have, the doctor can't check my uh, blood pressure without it shooting through the roof. Um, when we were trying to figure out if I had PTSD uh, or some sort of uh, seizure disorder a long time ago, uh, I had to go into a sleep clinic to where they had electrodes on my head and um, they were having problems uh, with getting good readings and all that because I had such a high anxiety, uh, like white coat syndrome of being... Uh, you know, approached by people in white coats, attaching things to me. So we'll have to do it in an environment where I'm, I am not triggered. That's something we've talked about. Now, it is, everyone that has spent time with me throughout this last two years, they understand that I'm not lying. I am telling the truth as I know it, as I believe it to be. There have been... Uh, they've done a lot of uh, reverse speech on me, found nothing uh, that was deceptive. Um, a re re recently, I can't remember her name, it's a, a really cool channel that does body language. Uh, she did, uh, uh, she had many people asking her, do body language on Corey Good? We want to know if he's telling the truth. She's, she did body language a study on me, and at the end she said, I'm not saying ETs are real, I'm saying this guy believes what he's saying. So. You know, if I took a uh, lie detector test and I pass it, a lot of the people are out there, what they're going to do is they're just going to say, he may have had a tack in his shoe. He uh, is a trained operative. Trained operatives spend time hooked up to those machines learning how to deceive them. You know, that, that's the next round. That's what I can So you're basically saying, like, 
why bother waste the energy going down that path when I have better things to do with my time? Right, right. Yeah, and, you know, I think there's enough information out there where people can decide whether, you know, I'm uh, being a pathological liar or if I'm telling something that I really believe. Now, whether you believe I'm mind-controlled, uh, these memories are implanted, whatever you believe, you need to kind of change your theory a little bit from me being an active liar to telling something that I really believe to be true, and then decide whether or not the information I believe to be true is true for yourself. So you're, you're basically saying, really, the weight would lie more on me being mind-controlled than it would be on me lying, because so many people have already said, like, yeah. That you're not lying based on reverse speech and the body language and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, as far as the minds coming to suppress your memories, when exactly did that happen again? That was in 2016? That was before I was even on Cosmic Disclosure. Okay. Yeah, I was, um, <clears throat> I, I had gotten injured on the job and I'd had a detached retina right around the same time period <clears throat> and ended up losing my job. We had to... Uh, moved out of the apartment we were in. We we're about to be evicted. So we moved into my parents' house for a couple of years while I was going through all of the, uh, you know, recovery, mm -hmm. or some of the recovery. So, you know, uh, you know, living with, you know, we had to live with my parents for a while. And that was actually, it was at my mom's and my mom and stepdad's house. Um, I was in the living room. They were appearing. It was the first time I met Gonzalez. I didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. It, you know, uh, he was just instructing me what was going on. And that's when, uh, in your interview with Stacy, she talked about she came out of the back room, walked in, and was like, "What is this? I'm not seeing this. This isn't happening." Yeah, I was yet. just about to mention that. If you want to hear Stacy's perspective on that, you can check out her video on my channel as well. So interesting. So that's when they came and they suppressed those painful memories that you had, and yes. you're not ready. You don't want to walk down that again that's why you no, want to do the repression no it was okay. very it was a very dark time you know i a lot of people in that have been in these programs a lot of the reason they don't want to talk is because they don't want to self-incriminate themselves they have been forced to do a lot of really dark things um, you know uh, forced they will either kill you or your family or you know any number of things so yeah there are things that uh, i was forced to be involved with that uh, i'm still trying to forgive myself for and trying to process so you know this is something that i have to handle uh, carefully in a natural way okay um threats toward bill ryan apparently okay on May 13th, 15 minutes into an interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan, Stacey Good was upset with Bill Ryan over a small grievance, which he never even discusses what that grievance was, and I couldn't find anything online yeah, discussing was, the, the grievance. The, the grievance, for the record, was it was over the entity attachment and uses Jesus, using Jesus' name thing. That's where the, the disagreement happened. And then it, the disagreement happened because of his Scientology beliefs against my Christian beliefs, Stacy has the same Christian beliefs. He started coming out real hard on me in the forum about the Christian beliefs and about how, you know, this is the way entity attachments work and all that. We disagreed. Stacy mentioned that it, uh, or talked about it was his Scientology belief system. Um, even though he practices something called free form Scientology, he insists, I am not a Scientologist. I am not a Scientologist. But that's like, you know, you were Catholic, I was Protestant, but we're both Christian, right? You know, it's splitting hairs and semantics. So that's where the big, like, kind of that big battle happened, and that's what he's referring to. Wasn't there also, the like, an interview that you had done where you had talked about that and he wanted to take that information yes. out of the interview? Yes. So there was there were two things. He wanted to take that information out of the interview that you were potentially going to go public with, not the, the with second your interview, The second interview okay. I did with Christine Anderson. Okay. That's when I talked about uh, using the name of Jesus to, to get rid of the entity attachments. Okay. And uh, he went through the roof on that. He was he, he was not going to put that on his channel. Was that the first time that you guys disagreed on something? Was that kind of the... Yes. That's where everything... That's when everything went south. And okay. if you look at his history, uh, we can put a list up of all of these people, Atticus and all these people through Project Avalon to where he's come out and said, this person's a real deal. This is really good information. And then he has some sort of just minor personality kind of conflict with, and then he comes out against him with both barrels, you know, and it's, uh, if we look back at the records of uh, what Carrie Cassidy said about why they broke up, uh, there were two of their whistleblowers that he started coming out against and was calling 
frauds when they she says they weren't. But he got triggered somehow against them. So anyone that he disagrees with or is triggered against, he has to destroy. Okay. So no journalistic value. So he says in an inter- the same interview, one hour in, this work he's getting into with Good doesn't have any academic or journalistic value and really looks more like a circus with the comis- bo- comic books and everything else. So what's your response to the claim that your work has no journalistic value. Well, what is, we were talking about this earlier, what is journalism? Well, it's basically bringing news out. So right. reporting on news. Right. So uh, a person coming forward, giving a lot of information about a secret space program, uh, hidden technologies, uh, the need for us to grow spiritually, which every ET experience that people have reported, what are the two things they say? release suppressed technologies and then grow spiritually or become more, you know, spiritual. Those are, those are the two things that the, all the aliens that have contacted us are asking us to do. That's what we're trying to do. And as far as the comic books, I mean, we already mentioned, right. You know, he, We've kind of beat that. Yeah. That horse. That's just, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. So let's talk a little bit about the Linda Moldenhow uh, situation. Right. So, um, after claiming that, she, so you came out during Contact in the Desert, you said that she was a name on the project, and then she... Right. Well, what had happened is, um, the night before, up until like one, we were doing the slides, and uh, we were talking about how Linda Moulton Howe, we were discussing with her writing the forward, and she was very excited about partaking in it. And, um, you know, uh, somehow it ended up on the slide, Linda Bolton Howe and uh, Dr. Sala's name was left off. And that, it was kind of embarrassing that that slide popped up. But in the announcement, and when the video comes out on the internet, people will see, I'm talking about people involved, not being authors. And I say, I see Linda Bolton Howe on the slide, and I'm, I'm surprised. And I said, oh, and Linda Bolton Howe yeah. might be involved. Okay. That's what I said. And then they, People took photos of the slide and uh, sent them into the dark journalist. Oh, okay. The dark journalist basically gaslit Linda Moulton Howe. He contacted her, said, these people are Satanists. Uh, they're saying that they're working with you. They say that you're writing a book. No, she's like, no, I'm not writing a book. Well, they're saying you're writing a book. You know, just totally manipulated and gaslit her. And uh, she's a strong Christian, kind of like I am. And when she saw all of the... Um, the video that he made calling uh, Roger a Satanist, she just had like a knee-jerk reaction and and pulled out and didn't pull out in a very graceful way, sadly. So let's talk a little bit about Roger Richards, Mm -hmm. who's one of your business associates. Can you tell us a little bit about how you met him and how you guys started working together? Yes. uh, Originally, when we started the Full Disclosure Project about a year ago, he wrote in and said he wanted to help. Um, He also had sent in... um, I wanted to do a bunch of uh, banner uh, or roadside advertising to where, you know, it talked about there's there's suppressed technologies that could that could save your life and stuff like that to kind of promote out that, you know, advanced technologies exist and the normal person can see it and think about it. And uh, he sent in some really cool ideas uh, on uh, billboards and he was writing in as Emma Gold and in my mind, it was a girl. I thought it was a girl. And I, he had, has a, a really interesting business to where um, he's helping a, his business is, is awesome. He's a cottage industry business that, um, like people in India that do crafts, and that's a dying art. He found a way to find people in the West that want to buy these things. So this it keeps the art alive, and it allows people to um, <clears throat> be able to uh, survive financially while selling their arts and crafts to boutiques. And he's done a lot of work with, uh, uh, you know, the child slave labor and uh, women's rights. He's heavily into that. Uh, he's got a documentary that's about to come out. Back when I was a religion major, uh, I worked a little bit with a guy that was in something called Probe Ministries. They investigated cults. So I actually sat there next to other religion majors and we interviewed real Satanists and talk to real Satanists to get information about it, to know how to counsel them later on. So I know the energy, the look, 
I know every, I know a real Satanist when I see one. And, uh, the, there's every bit of the energy that comes from him is, is very loving and caring. And that character characterization was based off of a tattoo. It's so interesting that you that synchronicity between where you were going to follow in your grandfather's footsteps, and then now here you are, and you have this blue avian message, and it's like you're really working toward spiritual truth. And yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, Roger Roger's a really good guy, and when all this came out, uh, it really hurt him deeply. You know, he even offered uh, to resign and, and all of these things, and I said, no way. You know, I mean. Um, when he, he was just a, a username until I met him at Mount Shasta in uh, 2016. Okay. That's the first time I met him. And we hit it off great. I told him I wanted to do a vlog. He uh, said he would help me edit it because I don't know the first thing about editing stuff. You know, he's going to teach me that as well. And he started editing my vlog. And I was talking to him about uh, this uh, uh, graphic novel idea that really... Uh, one of the other people on my team, Cam, really came up with the idea about, you know, that it would be a, a good way to get the information out. And then I brought that to him, and he's a doer. And he he got to work putting teams together, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. We've been, we work well together. We're a very good team. So I can see why certain people would want to split us up. But, you know, a lot of the stuff... Almost all of it that's out there being said, some of the recent testimony about his business practices, um, they're, they're, they're not telling the truth. Uh, we've got the emails as well on it. We've showed, showed them to uh, Justin and a few people. It doesn't match up with the claims that are being made from people uh, that are going on the dark journalists who happen to be members of Project Avalon mm -hmm. that are spreading these lies. Well, I work with you and Roger and... I love working with both of you guys, so, and I already went on the record and talked about how professional it was, so, uh, and that, my friends, oh, one last allegation, then we get to the fun stuff, the viewer questions, uh, can you talk a little bit about the occult symbolism drama with the hand signal and the blue avian? The blue avians, boy, they did an interesting job of putting, uh, Baphomet next to, uh, the blue avian and trying to say that it was a Luciferian or, or a satanic image. And if they had spent, once again, done any journalistic research, if they would have gone on, gone online and not just said, I want this to be Satanist, boom, 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 look up Baphomet, put the blue avian next to it. Well, if they would have done what we're gonna do right now, go online, look up hand signs and art and, and all of this, they're going to see the same hand sign used over and over and over in Art of Jesus. The blue avian message uh, of being service to others is very much like do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. This is a very Christian-like message. So uh, in a marketing way, they were trying to tie it to Satanism to give people that are love and light type people to make them have that visceral reaction, and it worked. You know, they're, uh, they have a lot of experience in marketing, so they knew how to put that together in a way that would manipulate minds. Who created that drawing? Of, oh, the blue alien? The yeah. blue avian? Yes. That was um, uh, Android Jones, and he did that in 2015 at Gaia when we were uh, all sitting in a boardroom. I had, they had the animation of it actually being drawn that we can that we can show as well whose decision was it to put the hand signal in the drawing well it was as i was describing to him how they would hold their hand up and do these different hand signals mm -hmm. and put their lips like this mm -hmm. as they were uh, connecting to us mm -hmm. uh, that i'm going to hand my help held my hand up i was doing that and so he incorporated it into the, the drawing. So you've actually seen the blue avians hold up their hand like that? Yes. Did you ask them, or do you know why they would particularly make that hand signal? It's not just that is one of the hand signals. Uh, they, it, it is an interesting way they will communicate. They'll sit there, and it's as if they're trying to talk because their, uh, their mouth is doing kind of like that. But they're, with one hand, they'll be doing like motions and hand signals. Maybe they're half Italian. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know they use like, they use a hand, hand signals, and that happened to be one I was showing while he was drawing. But if you put the picture next to Baphomet, 
the, the thing that's doing like this is pointed down, mm -hmm. and in all the ones of Jesus, it's pointing up. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, them trying to say that it was a satanic image was really reaching, reaching really far. Okay. All right. So thank you for all that. Thank you for clearing some of that stuff up. I hope, do, do you feel better about... Is yeah. there anything else that you it's, feel like you haven't touched on that you wanted to discuss as far as allegations? No, you know, I think everyone out there, uh, you know, I guess you're, people are tired of hearing you use your own discernment. You know, that's what I've been saying from the beginning. But if energetically you are drawn to the information that Bill Ryan and the dark journal journalists are putting out, then more power to you. If you are drawn to the... Uh, more spiritual ascension type information and trying to make reality a better place and more power to you. Now, there's, like I said, there's something about these energetic changes that are pulling us and making us reveal our true natures. So I think many people can take this an opportunity to look at how they responded to this disinfo campaign, this smear campaign. You know, use it as a mirror. Why, what triggered you to make you fall for it or jump on board with it? Um, and, you know, until we all start to work on those little things about ourselves, we're, we're not going to move on spiritually or intellectually. You're, you're always going to be stuck. So, um, you know, I've kind of been forced to deal with a lot of things. You know, I, I told you, you know, uh, there was, uh, like Kari said, there were two major things I had to deal with were uh, some issues with my marriage and with my father. And in re recent times, uh, catalysts uh, forced me to deal with, you know, long issues that needed to be dealt with in my marriage. And uh, I hadn't spoken with my dad in six years. And um, a situation popped up to where I was able to have a meeting with him. And we were able to come together and, um, in a very loving way, forgive each other and move on, which was very healing for me. That, this just happened right after Father's Day this year. So, you know, those have been major things for me spiritually to move on. And uh, people that are uh, jealous of me talking to beings or whatever, they're not listening very closely to what's happening because I'm not getting patted on the back or told that I'm some sort of uh, uh, messiah figure. They're sitting out, point, they're, they're constantly pointing out all my flaws. You know, I'm like, pat me on the back every once in a while, guys. <laughs> you know, the last big one was that, you know, as an INFJ, and the uh, trauma I had as a child, the only uh, being very intuitive, I could read people, and I developed, I, I couldn't control my environment unless I manipulated it. And at a young age, I started becoming manipulative. And um, they pointed out to me that uh, my manipulations had caused damage to other people's free will quite a bit, and uh, showed me examples of it, and it just made me sick. And it was something that I've been dealing with that for about six months now, uh, you know, trying to fully understand that and make sure it's no longer a uh, personality distortion of mine. So, you know, we've all, we've all got to do that work. Or if we focus on other people, uh, on information that goes against our truth and, and just battle, do battle with that information, then, you know, we're, we're not going to evolve. So yes, thank you to everybody for your support and sending in your questions. And I poured through over 200 of them. Actually, I poured through all of them, but there were over 200 of them. And I pulled out just a few of them. I couldn't, obviously we can't ask you all of them, but if you ever have an extra five hours of time, <laughs> we can jump on a call. Yeah. I mean, we could even do something where we do viewer questions here and there if you're interested in something like that, because yeah. there are lots of questions, lots of really good ones. Yes. That's, and when I, uh, some of the cosmic disclosures that have been the Q, uh, Q and A episodes, viewer Q and A, have been the most popular, and it seems like one of the most popular things is I usually give a talk and then afterwards I do a Q and A. So yeah, it seems to be there seems to be a lot of questions. Yes, there's a lot of information that you cover and. I think it's interesting too to get these questions because for me watching I've watched the majority of Cosmic Disclosure not in the last six months just because of everything that's going on but uh, to see where people are at in your within your testimony based on the questions right. that they're asking it's cool so um, let's see do you have knowledge of interference attacks and 
parentheses, specifically being orchestrated, triggered via individuals, groups, in parentheses, channeling influence, monarch, Manchurian, non-human interference. And if you have, what methods do you recommend to help those who may be unaware of this happening in the community or within themselves? Yeah, it's, it's a really big problem. It's something that uh, since, uh, uh, I guess, it, this organized campaign to attack us occurred, we started receiving also very energetic attacks. Uh, people, um, you know, I don't know if it's people with voodoo dolls and pens, you know, hiding in their closet, you know, jabbing, but, you know, we've had a lot of that type of stuff happen. Um, yeah, the, uh, recognizing it, it can be a little bit diff difficult. You know, you have to do a lot of meditation and, and really uh, look at a situation to see if it's really your own karma that you don't want to admit, it, admit to, or if it is a, a negative breeding, as they say, or if it is an actual attack by the enemy. Uh, those that, uh, you know, there's, there's no one quick fix for people to deal with these attacks because every person is energetically, psychically different and they use different methods. Um, people can be taught a foundation of how to protect yourself. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I've been talking with uh, Gerald O'Donnell a little bit about developing uh, not only some of his uh, RV course, but also uh, he's been working on like a spiritual protection type thing, uh, type course. Um, I've been, you know, speaking with him to see if we can, you know, work together on that because there are a lot of questions out there and, um, and a lot of people are, are, are being told to, you know, if you need to become a psychic warrior, come to this workshop, we'll teach you how and they'll charge like five, eight thousand dollars and people will go and they'll spend this time and they try to teach them this cookie cutter method that may work for some people, but not everyone. So uh, when it comes to defending yourself against psychic attacks, um, once you identify it as a psychic attack or some sort of energetic attack, your defense method is going to be different than mine or someone else's. It's just fine-tuning that method uh, is, is the most important thing. And a comment on that, too, would be if you've gone to any of these courses or you've watched any of these videos or read books on how to protect yourself, you can learn that methodology that might be cookie cutter and then you know, you exactly. learn it and then you expand and grow exactly. on it, which is a lot of like yeah. how martial arts works. Right. You learn yeah. The, yeah. yeah. You take, take in the method and make the method your own. Yes, exactly. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I thought this was a really interesting question. So your friend Kari from the inner earth, uh, has always enjoyed, this is Eric asked this question. So, um, the question is, so it's the blue avian contact that Corey has raw tear air. Not sure if that's spelled correctly. Begins his, her name with Ra, which uh, in the Law of One, they say that Ra is the group consciousness. And then Tier Air is the representative in the individual form. So the question is, wondering if the same concept applies to Ka Ri. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is something that I just recently spoke with David Wilcock about. Um, yes. Uh, I have use the full name Kari on purpose to see who is telling me the truth about contact when they approach me. Um, Ka is part of the name. She has me call her Ari. I don't call her Kari. It's Ari from the house of Ka. Her sister, her name starts with Ka, but it means that they're from the house of Ka is what it means. So that's the first time anyone's asked that question, and I've been... Uh, purposefully uh, keeping it out of the public eye. Interesting. Yes. All right, Eric, you're very astute. Very good. <laughs> I just told David Wilcock that one not even two or three days ago. Interesting. Synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. So it's like a last name, but it's like a first last name. It's kind of like before. a designation. Like, you know, uh, she used the lineage of the House of Ka. Whatever that means. Okay, cool. So let's see. This is a really good one. Okay. This question comes from Jonathan. And he says, if the ascension of frequencies is a normal cosmic event, some of those who are already at a higher frequency must have observed this phenomenon in the past. Have you pursued questioning them to be more specific on what to expect and when? It seems like the information coming out is pretty sparse and even vague, and yet it sounds like it would be the most profound occurrence in recorded history. Mm -hmm. So has it happened to anybody, any of the other beings before? Yes. And yes, it's... it's 
it, it happens all throughout the cosmos. And have they talked about it, I guess? Like, um, yeah, well, um, I have given information on uh, uh, Mika's people. They most recently uh, went through that process, not only uh, of what we're calling an ascension process, an energetic consciousness change is what it really is. Um, they went through this consciousness renaissance already, and uh, the process that they went through is similar to ours. It uh, first comes with people becoming empowered, standing up with that power, demanding the truth, and then taking that truth and creating a whole new reality. That's what his people did. That's what we're in the process of trying to do. And we have a certain time frame to be able to turn things into a optimal temporal reality. If we don't, then uh, we're, we're not going to have this beautiful future that uh, we've all dreamed about and aspired for. Okay. So, opening up about family. That's the next. So this question comes from Darren. Okay. And so he said, when I first started first <laughs> When I first started following Corey online, he didn't share much about his family, which I understand completely. Lately, seems to have been uh, soon after the Chinook helicopter buzzed by his house, he's been opening up quite a bit. So his question is, how did you decide to start sharing more about your family? That was very difficult. I knew that it would make some of them a target for these trolls, which, you know, is unfortunate, but, you know... One, one of the big things that, uh, I guess, Bill Ryan used to say to me is that uh, if you come out into the public, uh, they can't knock you off because then they'll be proving your story or something like that, you know. And there is a little bit of truth to that. You know, if you go public, and especially public in a big way, what if, you know, I, they would have knocked me off? That just would have validated a lot of what I was saying. So You become a martyr. Yeah, I become a martyr for a cause. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to my family... We were, we were under quite a bit of threat, and it was to show my family out there, just not as being a concept, but just to see a real family, and that the threats coming in were against a real family. Another reason I started doing the vlog and become, being more public was that a lot of people were saying that I was trying to build myself up as a messiah figure and all this, when I'm just a regular guy. Um, anyone that spent time with me, no, I'm just a regular guy. I don't walk around with airs like I'm spiritually above everyone, you know, and so I, I, I don't do that. And uh, I wanted to chronicle that and show people kind of like who I really am so that they wouldn't look up to me. Because the whole point of this Blue Avian message is not to find someone to pray to or look up to. It is to look within, take all of that energy that you're spending out here and use it within. And if you focus within and start fixing things in yourself, then like I say, uh, you're gonna make the world a better place one person at a time. This question is from a person that is retired military. So I'm retired Air Force. I remember while in college, when I was in ROTC, I was very curious, maybe a little bit obsessed about UFOs. And I frequently thought to myself, I wanted to get involved in the process of discovery more about them firsthand. I knew for certain the Air Force was keeping tons of information from the public, and I knew I wanted to get involved. My question is, if I was inadvertently part of something I no longer remembered, how could I find out? How can we find out if we've ever been blank slated? Would you recommend hypnosis? First of all, regression therapy can be a wonderful tool, but you, someone that just puts up a shingle and says, I'm a regression therapist, can do more damage. They can implant memories, uh, not meaning to. Uh, they can front load you with information. Uh, you know, like say some information that becomes a part of your psyche. In it. So you have to be very careful. Um, people that have had, you know, a good five, 10 years of experience doing it, I, I would check the references in the, before considering. Uh, but regression therapy is a double-edged sword. It's a, it can be a, a beautiful thing, but it can also cause a lot of problem. Now, how do you know? Uh, if you have missing time during the time you served in the military, if uh, you have dreams of 
occurrences that did not happen consciously in your service, your memories consciously of being in the service, then there's a good chance that uh, you were being blank slated. In the Air Force especially, there are many, in civilian contractors, they are blank slated at the end of every day of work. They'll go home not remembering anything that they did at work. And they've accepted that that's a part of the job. So, the, but uh, a lot of people that have been in the military have been involved in things that they don't remember. Um, it has to, you, you have to have some sort of an inkling that it happened to you before you start going to like a regression therapist. You know, but you usually will have some sort of an idea. If they're a part of something like what you were a part of, like the 20 and back, if they're going off planet and then they're coming back, and then so they're actually traveling back in time, they won't experience missing time, right? right. No, so if, are there any other ways that you could tell if you've been uh, being well, like the, uh, yeah, the, the having dreams, the memories coming back, first of all, in your dreams, uh, you having like uh, PTSD, but with no real explanation to connect to the PTSD, uh, those are some signs, but... In the military, uh, the, the, most of the people in the 20, back, 20 and back programs were military. Very few were civilian assets, and I happen to be one of them. Okay. Okay. Great answer. So this is a follow-up. How many people were – do you know how many people were part of the 20 and back? And, like, when it started, how long it lasted, and when, if it's still going on, like um, – I'm told that uh, – most re that it, uh, most that it's still being used within the military, but they are using a lot of cloning technology now, uh, a lot more to where uh, they're using disposable human beings that they clone. Uh, they're starting to use that as a uh, a method now to have manpower because there are so many things that can go wrong with uh, you know putting a person back in their life. Um, you know, afterwards they can start ha having the memories come back. Uh, weird behavior uh, can can occur, so and, and and it's harder to keep the secret. So there could be a gigantic cloning operation going on in Antarctica, and then they're just shipping them off world. Yep. Sounds like a really good sci-fi movie. It does, doesn't it? Let's make that one next. Let's see. Okay. So. What is your opinion of some of these other people? You don't have to use names that have come out as saying that they were also part of the secret space program. Like, how has that affected you? I guess turning that question back on you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've discussed the fact that uh, some of the intelligence people said that they were going to super soldier the secret space program topic. Uh, basically, uh, some people came out that were part of super soldier programs, which, you know, they're uh, in, uh, mentally and physically enhanced to do certain, you know, uh, operations. Um, these people were starting to come out and tell their story and to dilute the information. They started uh, manipulating people to believe that they were a part of it. And then all of a sudden now you have like 800 people going to a convention saying, I'm a super soldier, I'm a super soldier. When probably one to 3% of them were actually in the program, the rest are there as sub subterfuge. Um, they were going to do the same thing with the secret space program. And all the people, all these people come up with wild stories that are, you know, similar to mine uh, about being in the space program. At the same time, we have people that are watching Cosmic Disclosure and reading information about it online that are being, that are having like actual triggers of memories and, and that kind of a thing. So uh, it's become kind of diluted. It's hard to really tell unless I spend time with them who is, uh, you know, giving the real information. And quite honestly, it's not my place to go out and say, you know, all these people are telling the truth and are not. Um, I did that <clears throat> on uh, uh, one occasion where the person was causing a little bit of damage, I was told. But for the most part, uh, you know, I just let people share their information. Uh, the rest of the world can take it or leave it. Fair enough. Okay, so let's see. Oh, I thought this was really interesting. Phyllis asked a question about uh, brain and memory erase is what she called it. Is there any correlation to your brain erase the same as people who are incarnated who don't remember who they were prior to this birth? Is it the same thing? 
So with the blank slating slash what I call soul amnesia. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are a lot of similarities. I really can't answer that question other than to speculate, mm -hmm. but you know how people, a uh, few people seem to be able to have bleed through recall of past life memories while others are not. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there are a lot of correlations there to where it looks like some, uh, before we enter this life, we are blank slated uh, in a much deeper way mm -hmm. than, than the way the, the military program does. That's a pretty interesting correlation. Yeah, I had never thought of that before until yeah. that question came in from Phyllis and I thought, she's making me think a little bit. Sure. It was a cool thought. Yeah, there's really some bright uh, viewers yeah. that, that watch this information. Yeah, a lot of these emails I was getting and I was just sitting there like, oh man, it's just like question after question of a great question. Yeah. So That's one of the things that's so you know, humbling. I'm, there's so many really spiritual people in this community and I'll be standing on stage and I'll feel the spiritual energy coming from them and I'm humbled because I'm sitting there and I'm talking to a lot of these people and I'm sharing concepts that I don't need to be explaining to them. They could probably explain to me better. You know? There's <laughs> a lot more spiritual people, a lot more spiritually developed, you know, than I am that are in this community. And uh, it's it can be hum humbling sometimes. I've you know, at meet and greets, you know, you'll meet, like, someone will come up and, like, a lot of these ladies, they have this goddess energy about them. They'll come up to you and, uh, and, and give you a hug and you feel, like, this just beautiful, loving goddess energy, you know, that, I mean, the energy from these people is amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I bet that had a huge effect on you coming out of just, like, the dark place where you feel like you're alone and then being able yeah. to finally, like, come out yeah. into the... The real world is. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's see. What do we have here? Oh, I just said real world, and that's the very next question. Synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Your experience with this situation mirrors back your own life experiences where it feels like you're living in two separate realities, one spiritually based and the other one materialistic and limited. Our goal seems to be to acclimate and balance these two forces. How do you achieve that balance without getting caught up in all the noise of this reality? Is it also difficult to progress spiritually when in this duality? Yeah, it's uh, it's very hard to progress spiritually. I mean, the, a lot of people have seen the progress I've made over the last couple of years. It's been hard fought. I mean, it's been very difficult. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, are putting out, you know, Corey's making all this money for making up stuff for the show, and he's just kicking back, you know, laughing at everybody. It's not the case. <clears throat> you know, I'm, like I stated before, I'm being forced to work on some really uh, uncomfortable things about myself. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to grow uh, spiritually or, uh, you know, in this reality. You know, you know, you'll find yourself, you know, stuck in jobs. You're, you'll find yourself never evolving as a person. You'll look back five years ago, you're pretty much the same exact person as you are now. That... That is, a, that is a cycle that we've got to break. You know, we have to look back six months ago and see, wow, I've changed this, this, and this. You've got to see progress or you're going to get discouraged. And people that become discouraged, that happens through fear. And you know, fear leads to hate and hate leads to the dark side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think that's why a lot of people are being drawn to the dark side right now. How are some of the ways that you're progressing spiritually? Do you, are there books that you're reading, p people that you follow, or is no, it meditative work? You know, I'm not a real big book reader. Um, I mean, I've got some, some books that I've read. Um, <clears throat> most of the spiritual guidance I'm getting is uh, you know, through Kari. Kari, uh, I guess I can say that. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so a lot of the healing and spiritual growth that I'm having is occurring, you know, through Kari. She is, uh, you know, really spending a lot of time forcing me to focus on things that are holding me back. And I still have quite a bit to work on. I'm nowhere near perfect. Uh, my wife can tell you that. But uh, I'm trying. And uh, I think that's the... The biggest thing is that you have to try. You have to put in the effort. If you sit back and are waiting for something magical to happen to you, you're going to be disappointed. You have to go out and seek out the magic. 
Be the magic. Be the magic. <laughs> okay, so let's. So our next question comes from Sydney, and she says, "How would one discern if the blue avians were from the true light of the creator and not the false light of an imposter race?" I've heard that the blue avians are an Illuminati mind control program, and that high level members at parties put on a blue avian headdress. <laughs> yeah, the. Uh... A lot of this goes back to ancient Egypt, when the, the Blue Avians tried to intervene uh, one other time to, to get us to, to, to change. Uh, the uh, information that they brought was used as a control system and adopted by the Illuminati. Now, I have not seen any, anything about a blue bird mask being worn at any type of Illuminati functions. That's, you know, people are just kind of making stuff up and putting it out there. Um, a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, the blue avians are actually the reptilians in disguise. Uh, some of the military are, are trying to uh, make all this fit in their little box, and they're like, well, uh, we know the Nordics uh, do a lot of manipulation of humanity. We think it's, it's the Nordics that are creating the blue avians. So, you know, there's, you know, you do have to use discernment. And the biggest discernment I think you can use is, you know, what is the message? Is it a message of disempowerment? Um, I hear a lot of people out there that are saying uh, service to others is a psyop. It's a way to get us to uh, give away our sovereignty and think of other people and, and not think about ourselves and our own growth. And... <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. That's funny because as soon as you started talking about that, <coughs> I started getting, <coughs> I might get some water really quick. Holy crap. <coughs> That's really funny. <coughs> Some energies probably don't want you talking about that. Mm. <coughs> That's hilarious. Okay. I think the best way for anyone to discern whether something's coming from the light or the dark, it, it all goes back to you know a tree by its fruit, um, is truly a message of Forgiving, forgiving yourself and forgiving others for damage that they've done is that Illuminati or Luciferian. Is uh, uh, the fact that they want you to be, think thoughtful of other people, service to others, is that Luciferian? Is that, you know, it, it just doesn't bear out. Everything that, that all of the information that the Blue Avians have delivered has been positive empowering and lit uplifting spiritually. It has not, there has not been any type of negativity or divisive information. So. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> we have a question from Andreas from Germany. Do you ever get confused? How do you manage your memory? If you've experienced more than 120 and back, do you get confused about your timelines? Yes. Now, the, um, the 320 and backs occurred, uh, the last one, I believe, was in 1997. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> those two are mostly still suppressed because of the mind. Those seem to be the darkest things I was involved in, was during the, the last two. Now... I'm meeting with Gonzalez quite often because I'm having memory issues, uh, signs of uh, temporal dementia that uh, occur from uh, being a part of these 20 and back programs and being around torsion drives and all the uh, heavy fields involved with the technology. So, you know, uh, you know, that is affecting my memory. Now, one of the things that's been occurring that's pretty crazy is that I've been having these weird episodes where I'm flashing back to one of these 20 and backs that I don't have full memory of. Um, it's a weird thing. I, I will, all of a sudden, I will feel kind of confused and then bilocated, like I'm not, I'm somewhere else. And then I'll look around and the latest one was I was in a, uh, a full bio suit walking around, uh, what looked like a very ancient facility. Uh, and I was walking with a team of people, also all in, in these bio suits. And uh, all of a sudden, I 
went up against the wall, put my hands up against the wall, and was feeling all like I, I was, didn't kind of like, didn't know who I was, where I was, what was going on. But I was looking around, and uh, this woman's grabbing my helmet, looking at me, trying to talk to me, and she said, and she's telling someone else, "It's happening again. It's happening again." So it's like, um, it's not just your memory. You, your soul has like a zero time reference, mm -hmm. and when you're being pulled out of that time reference and put back in and you have like 20 years of memory, your psyche has to try to make sense of that. You know, it's, they're stacking the 20 years on top of each other. And then it, it you know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it can be, if I had full recall of the other two, it would, uh, I would probably be in the same state of, uh, being almost suicidal. So it's like your soul is existing in two places at once and you can go between those two. Yeah. It's, um, it's weird. It's almost like uh, I would be sitting here now and then all of a sudden bi-locate to that other timeline mm -hmm. and me and the other timeline is affected by me connecting to it. And it causes me to like in that timeline to also be like, whoa, what's going on? It's like There's you're like, astral projecting from here to there. Something. Yeah. And they, maybe you on that other timeline is feeling that interference. Yeah. There's something like that going on. Yeah, it's really weird. There are, there are a lot of weird things. And then psychologically, uh, your subconscious is trying to make sense out of three timelines or four timelines stacked on top of each other. And uh, your subconscious is trying to keep that in line with your zero time reference of, you know, the timeline that it knows, linear time. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for your psyche to make sense of it. How frequently does that happen? It's only happened a few times. Okay. Yeah. When was the first time it happened? The first time was right after Gonzalez told me uh, about the uh, two extra 20 and backs, uh, more details about it and, and uh, how it was affecting me. And he was doing work on me uh, to try to uh, alleviate some of the issues I was having. Interesting. So when you're, when you're away on the 20 and back, do you know, I mean, this might be a dumb question, but do you know that you're on the 20 and back. Like, do you know that you're going to be, so maybe when you're there on that timeline, you started thinking about you here on earth and there was a connection there Indeed. as well. Yeah. So that Einstein Rosenbridge is created <laughs> <laughs> between timeline timelines. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you to everybody for submitting questions and thank you, Corey, so much for coming on the show. And I wanted to end with letting you talk a little bit about Eclipse of Disclosure. Yes, we're going to have a huge event in McLeod, California. It is real close to Mount Shasta. It is going to be an awesome event of about 500 people, like-minded, positive people coming together to, to be with their tribe, as we call it. And uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, good speakers and workshops. We're going to have, let's see, uh, Jay Widener is our keynote. We have Bentinho Massaro. Dr. Sala is going to be there, Laura Eisenhower, uh, I think Clifford Lahuti is going to be there. Um, let's see, who am I missing? Um, not, not, not only that, uh, but we have uh, a lot of uh, people that are going to be giving workshops on what, you know. Eric walk. Rains, I think he's doing. Rains, yeah, 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 I'll be doing a workshop. Yes, I'm doing a workshop. Uh, I know that Jordan. Jordan. Jordan will be doing one. Jordan Sather. Yes, and, and uh, Justin Deschamps. Justin Deschamps. I think he's actually speaking. I don't know who. I think he's a speaker. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, Vivian Davis is going to be doing a presentation on the post disclosure project that has that has to do with the uh, psychology initiative of developing a uh, post post disclosure plan to help people cope. Uh, the, uh, I think that they're going to be doing some. Uh, pretty interesting workshops on, on, on different things, such as the Law of One. So it's, it's gonna be very cool. It's gonna be very fun. Uh, in 2016, in Mount Shasta, it was just Dr. Sala, Laura Eisenhower, and myself speaking, and we had over 300 people. It was packed. Everybody loved it. It was a place where so many beautiful things were born. So many people came together on this mission. Uh, we're looking really forward to it. Who's throwing the event and how did you guys, like, isn't it Full Disclosure Project? Yes, uh, Full Disclosure Project. Uh, uh, Roger's doing a lot of the work, but we have, uh, you know, like Adrian. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a lot of people on our team that are really uh, helping uh, get this 
organized, but this is going to be our first um, production as uh, a group. So we're really excited about it. That's awesome. Can't wait. And when is it? It is uh, during the eclipse in August, August 18th through, I believe, the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. And uh, uh, we have uh, a link to brown paper tickets where you can buy, uh, buy your tickets. Uh, we're also going to webcast it. It's not going to be live streamed because of uh, the technology isn't going to work with us there. But uh, we're going to be doing webcasts that people can purchase if you can't be there. But we really want to see you there. I want to meet you. This is going to be an event where it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction between the speakers and the people attending. We really want to see you there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Corey. And thank you guys. And make sure to subscribe to The Divine Frequency. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me at thedivinefrequency at gmail.com. Thanks, guys. Bye. Action. Okay. I am your cult leader. I command you act. <laughs> <laughs> Submit yourself before me now. Well, thank you, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a wonderful cult leader. I just thought. Yes. That's why everyone follows me. I'm so demanding. So, uh, yeah. thank you. What? Here, What's here, here's some Kool Aid. Oh, sweet! <laughs> Drink the whole thing. It may taste a little Drink bit like almonds.